Greetings, I'm Dr. Pang Hong Wu from Ang Teng Fong General Hospital, Singapore. Uh, thank you, ASEAN Miss, for inviting me to share my experience with the treatment of uh, L5S1 pathology using transaminal endoscopic approach. I will also use this opportunity to discuss the advantages of another favorite approach of mine, the contralateral approach. I work as a consultant in National University Health System Jurong Health Campus Orthopedic Surgery, Singapore. Um, in my population, we take about uh, take care of about 12% of the Singapore population and 7% uh, of the elderly population in Singapore. In my practice, I do about 60% of my cases with the endoscopic spine surgery, 70% of them are uniportal, and 30% are biportal surgery. Most of my surgery uh, are involving stenosis decompression, uh, as well as um, discectomy, and then we, I do some endoscopic fusion as well as uh, cervical thoracic cases. All right, this is my conflict of interest. And I would like to acknowledge uh, my mentor, Professor Hyo Song Kim from uh, Kanan Nanori Hospital, so South Korea, who have taught me endoscopy and also uh, assisted me with some slides of the talk. Generally, the reasons why we do endoscopic uh, surgery, be transforminal or contralateral interlaminal approach, is to have a target oriented surgery, preserving motion segment uh, and soft and bony tissue preservation, allow mobility of equipment and scope, and uh, allowing shorter hospital stay, less for perioperative pain, less anesthesia, and small cuts with huge rewards. However, in L5S1, unlike other um, lumbar levels, there's a high iliac crest or narrow pelvis. There's also a possibility of upriding ala close to the tra large transverse process, narrowing the window further. A white foramen and a large uh, L5S1 facet and a white interlaminal window. These are the specific characteristics of L5S1 level. As you can see uh, from this picture, which is uh, kindly provided by Professor Kim, uh, we have a various type of this be uh, uh, central um, orminal up or upward migrating and downward migrating disc. As we target the scope, we realize that the upward migrating discs are difficult to assess for various reasons. One, the interparticular distance in L5S1, although it's wide, however, it is uh, at the inclination due to the presence of uh, iliac crest. The height of iliac crest really dictates the inclination that we can, capillary caudal inclination that we can give uh, in the endoscopic transforming approach. At times, the uh, large TP and uh, large ALA further limit this uh, window of, uh, for the scope to uh, man manipulate. So I find that uh, caudal migration, central migration for hormonal disc and extra hormonal disc are uh, easier than uh, upward migrating disc in a uh, transformer approach. Uh, a narrow pelvis also further complicate matters if you want to do a central disc. So uh, as the distance from the iliac crest is uh, very narrow uh, from the uh, central disc region. So all this uh, together with a white foramen, which means that there might be a lot of bony resection required for central disc or the foramen uh, paracentral disc. Uh, we may consider using interlaminal approach for central and paracentral disc or upward migrating disc, since it has a wide interlaminal window where we can explore. However, our topic today is on transforminal endoscopic surgery, and uh, my focus uh, will be talking about that. Um, we first uh, analyze patients who have L5S1 prolapse disc on the MRI and look for uh, any contraindication for transformative approach, such as uh, existing nerve root abnormality. Using trigonometry, uh, especially the tangent, to calculate uh, the distance from the midline uh, for the approach. Using the AP lateral view, we look, for, look out for uh, the iliac crest level, pelvis size, and uh, whether there's a, a for level counting, lumbarization, or sacralization. Uh, on the lateral view, we'll also look at the size of foramen and the level iliac crest. And you can see here, I use the trigonometry and calculator for ACM for the case I'm going to present later. Uh, Girish and uh, his group, uh, Dr. Prasad and Girish and uh, uh, the Indian group uh, actually found that um, using various parameters to assess whether the height of iliac crest can be suitable for trans, trans iliac approach or supra iliac approach, they basically look at the tip of the height of the iliac crest in the AP lateral view and looking at the parameters such as the um, uh, upper end plate uh, discal level, as well as that of the lower end of the L5 pedicle. And uh, on the AP view and on the lateral view, looking at the lower end of the pedicle level to dictate whether it is uh, super suitable for supra ilia or trans ilia approach. And they find that uh, for the type one and type two, uh, probably supra ilia is possible. Uh, for the type three, I think they recommend trans iliac approach. For type three, meaning that they, the iliac crest is way higher than that of the pedicle left, uh, line, and uh, it's also um, uh, way higher than that of the inferior aspect of the pedicle. For uh, trans iliac approach, sequential rimmer is needed to make a window of the iliac bone of the infiltration of LA to create a space uh, 
through the IAC crash into the transforminal window. And in this anatomical study by Osman, we find that uh, the, this trans ILAC window is about 4.1 cm uh, anterior lateral to the PSIS and um, it's uh, uh, posterior to the sacral ala and cephalic to S1 pedicle. The trans ILAC tract does not violate the retroperitoneal space and is safe distance from the lumbosacral trunk. In uh, actually, it's also far from the gluteal uh, neurovascular bundle. Personally, I do not do trans ILAC approach. I mainly do supra ILAC approach. If there's a need for trans ILAC approach, I tend to do interlaminar or interlaminar contralateral approach. I published a few articles on the manual palpation technique together with my colleagues from South Korea and India. Uh, and I uh, will be sharing in the next sharing review in the next few last slides. Basically, um, this uh, is also seen uh, from our article in the Journal of Spine Surgery. Basically, we want to doubt at the L5S1 uh, trans cambin uh, triangle. First, we mark the midline of the patient, and then we mark the visco space, uh, the superior M, uh, M plate of S1. Then so we mark um, the approach from the AP view. Uh, I tend to do it in a, a slightly cavalier caudal and uh, lateral medial direction, as seen here. Uh, we mark the eyelid crest. You can use un, do that under fluoroscopy or under manual palpation. I tend to do it with fluoroscopy. We manually palpate the muscle margin. Uh, the incision uh, approach should be medial to that of the lateral, uh, the margin between the erector spine and the soft tissues. And on the lateral view, we turn to the lateral view and look for the approaches again to the Cambin triangle. And uh, we mark the um, uh, posterior spinous process at, uh, in the patients who would like to do a para uh, central disc. And uh, we, me we measure distance from the midline. This, uh, I hope, mid match the preoperative um, uh, distance, which is X. Uh, this X distance can be ranging from 6 cm to 15 cm, depending on the position of this and the physique of the patients. I do not recommend absolute numbers when you do endoscopy because uh, every patient's pathology of the disc location as well as the a physique is different. So I've done a uh, transforming on a 15 cm for midline and I have done uh, 6 cm for midline as well. For the handling of the foramen, uh, superior articular process, foramenal party technique can be done inside out, outside in, and mobile outside in. I have uh, described that in my uh, articles as well. I think for the mobile outside in, you can use the strict bar articulator, uh, uh, it would be useful with side firing laser, although I do not tend to use them. Uh, front rimmer and side rimmer has its advantages, and uh, we can analyze them another time. So to discuss this the case of a right last mobile disc, a 37 year old who has a right sciatica uh, with a straight leg raise of 30 degree, has a foramenal disc in the right L5 S1 region. She has pain and a relief by sensory nerve root block for three days only, and the pain recurred failed conservative treatment. I plan my trajectory as described just now, and uh, we did a transforminal approach for this patient. Um, it was 8 p.m. from the midline. First, we uh, exposed the uh, facet joint. Uh, the nine o'clock pos uh, position is caudal. Three o'clock position is the head, and the uh, twelve o'clock position is the back. So we expose the facet joint with the radial frequency ablation, um, uh, and then we do a foraminoplasty. As I mentioned, I uh, tend to use a mobile outside in technique, uh, direct visualization of the superior articular facet, and uh, do a endoscopic drilling with a three point five mm burr. Uh, I do uh, release the foramen, foraminal ligament by uh, using a 90 degree keratin punch. And um, then uh, this space is uh, visualized. As you can see that the exiting nerve root is uh, directly visualized in this approach as it is a SDM for midline uh, and it's a foraminal disc. So uh, we uh, protect the exiting nerve root with the tank and uh, remove the disc from the disc space. I use in vitro carmine pre-op to light up the disc better. The nerve root is really closely adherent to the foraminal disc. So uh, I use the radio frequency ablation to uh, uh, release the adhesion for, from the disc and the nerve roots. This patient, mind you, had the nerve root block before, so uh, adhesion uh, can be common as, uh, after a nerve root block. And um, we use the probe and gently uh, lift the um, and exiting nerve root away from the right L5S1 uh, from the nerve disc, and uh, then we perform a discectomy. Uh, after a few bites of the discectomy, the nerve root can be manipulated further and uh, more discectomy can be performed. You can also use the tank of the uh, retracted tube, working, chan uh, working tube, uh, to uh, explore the disc inside. Uh, we we uh, tend to do a uh, discectomy uh, sufficient enough to prevent uh, recurrence. Loose fragment, which is lighted up by uh, indigo carmine, is uh, um, performed. Uh, release and discectomy is performed on that. Uh, you can do annuloplasty with the radio frequency ablation as well, shrinking the excessive um, annular soft tissue uh, while performing discectomy. 
Uh, we explore both the exiting nerve root and the traversing nerve root. Uh, if necessary, more foraminoplasty can be performed and uh, more foraminal ligament can be released. Uh, for patients with uh, lateral recess stenosis, you can also use the uh, articulated burr or uh, using a straight burr uh, with um, a mixture of side firing laser as well as a uh, garrison ronger to uh, perform uh, decompression of the lateral recess. Not necessary in this case. Now you can see the traversing and exiting nerve root well decompressed as we pull out the scope. Um, and uh, it is um, no nerve damages is in, uh, and uh, no excessive bleeding. Transformational surgery is very nice. For this patient, she choose GA. I tend to use LA sedation. And uh, in this case, uh, I didn't use uh, um, Ropi Barkin injection and uh, intra op. And uh, he, he developed a right L5 uh, dysesthesia. Uh, it's a grade 2 dysesthesia, but the MRI looks like fully decompressed. So I give a sensory nerve report post of day one. That block and the patient uh, subsequently uh, complete relief of pain and uh, is very happy with the surgery. But she has a few days of, uh, she has post op day one, she has dysesthesia, and I would like to discuss about that. Uh, in transforminal surgery, it does happen. And I published that in uh, with my colleagues uh, in the Indian Spine Journal as well. One of the complications is post op dysesthesia. Um, it, Presents really usually dermatomal distribution of hyperalgesia or allodynia in a particular dermatome, in this case, would be L5. And the MRI uh, post op does not show any significant compression of the neural element. The, there is a quick relief of the diagnostic uh, with a diagnostic or therapeutic nerve root block. Uh, I, I felt that the causes can be radiofrequency ablation, retraction of the working cannula on the nerve, or even manipulation of the probe. They have good prognosis and uh, with conservative treatment. Uh, some of the uh, colleagues may, may not agree with uh, nerve root block post op, but I, I tend to do them and uh, relieve the symptom early so that they can get on and move uh, and uh, do their daily activities early post op. So in this case, uh, I've highlighted uh, with the Indian groups, uh, um, this is actually a suprilar approach that we use, and uh, she's actually a type one type of, uh, of uh, uh, pelvis, uh, iliac crest. Uh, I tend not to do trans iliac approach, so I do not do type three. For the type two, I also have a low threshold of doing the interlaminal approach. Um, for me, I feel that the advantage of transformational approach, of course, LA can be given with sedation. Uh, it is also easier for uh, assessment of far-off syndrome extra disc. There's a less ability to decom decompress in the central and lateral recess stenosis, in my opinion. Um, there um, is an early direct visualization of the exiting nerve root, and uh, you can encounter traversing nerve root late. Uh, this is a, a technique that uh, a lot of endoscopic surgeons are familiar with, and uh, we can able to do LA sedation. Another technique that uh, I will be going through later will be a contralateral approach. This approach, we can do a central lateral recess and foraminal stenosis decompression. In, at the same time, we do not really need to touch the exiting nerve root uh, most of the time. And um, we can, however, we will be encountering the traversing nerve root early. And uh, also, there's a steep learning curve in contralateral approach, as it's not a traditional endoscopic approach, uh, but it, and it needs to be done under epidural on G8. So for transforminal and the contralateral approach, as uh, highlighted by these two uh, landmark paper, uh, earlier on, my, my uh, mentor, Professor Hugh Song Kim, published an uh, earlier series as well with Dr. Bai Park uh, and his group, uh, highlighted the topic in ECTA and uh, on how to perform this uh, double crush syndrome. It's essentially, uh, this is the differences in terms of learning curve. I think the contralateral approach is uh, kind of uh, not so familiar with more and most endoscopic surgeons, so it's a difficult learning curve, uh, but it can, um, Although we can do extra foramen decompression, can be difficult for early adopters of this technique. Uh, but however, intra or, or lateral recess is very good. And um, uh, there is very minimal uh, uh, facet joint violation. Uh, however, they need the epidural anesthesia. And uh, this is a video of how it's done. Basically, we start from the contralateral side, meaning if we do a right L5S1 foramen, uh, we'll be uh, starting from the left. We target the base of the spinal process. We do a decompression, and then we change to a smaller working channel. Uh, we expose the spine, uh, contralateral. Uh, we expose first the um, base of spinal process, we drill through it, and, and work underneath the sublaminar region. Then we look at the contralateral superior articular process. We do a flavectomy and uh, expose exiting nerve root. Uh, we do a foraminal decompression by uh, drilling the uh, superior articular process with the contralateral side. Uh, and then underneath the exiting nerve root, uh, we have given in the coma, usually it's lighter in blue, and then we can perform a discectomy. As you can see here, you can see the exiting nerve root. We do not need to uh, retract the exiting nerve root while we perform this surgery. This uh, scope is tilted such a way that the exiting nerve root is at 12 o'clock position, and uh, we can. Uh, do a full release of the contralateral side, and uh, we can see that there's a free and uh, pulsating ex exiting nerve root. Using the X-ray, you can uh, guide ourselves all the way to extra foraminal region, and you can see that uh, it's well decompressed from the 
um, central, lateral recess, and the foramenal and extraforaminal region. And you can see from the MRI that the, this direction of decompression is well decompressed. Uh, with the study that we have done with my group, uh, Professor Hyun Kim, Jim Kim, uh, and, we, and Dr. Itai Jang, Professor Itai Jang, we felt that uh, both ELD and ICLDF uh, do contribute uh, to uh, post op dysesthesia. However, uh, we find that the higher grade uh, post op dysesthesia, meaning uh, grade 2 or grade 3, where we essentially there is some sort of uh, dorsal root ganglion, uh, either neuroplexia injury or true injury, is uh, higher in the transformer group. Although there's no statistical difference between the two groups, uh, uh, but uh, we can see the clinical difference of a uh, up to 12% in transforminal group as, uh, as compared to interlaminal contralateral group. There isn't much study. In fact, it's one of the few studies that ever compare uh, dorsal root ganglion post op dysesthesia between the two approaches. Uh, so the literature is uh, still not robust in this, uh, this uh, uh, discussion. So uh, we would uh, take uh, with uh, more studies in the future to evaluate that. Uh, the effect of transformer and contralateral approach on the dysesthesia. For, however, in uh, patients with nerve root abnormalities, such as conjoined nerve root, duplicate nerve root, or uh, anastomosis of nerve roots, um, it is advisable to not attempt uh, transformer approach, uh, especially with duplicate nerve root, because the uh, risk of post operative dysesthesia or nerve root injury is very high. So, in my opinion, uh, in encountering L5S1 prolapses, uh, we look at whether it's a challenging pathology or challenging physical anatomy. If there is a foraminal disc, uh, then it is in the area where both the contralateral and transforminal approach can, uh, can be accessible. Uh, contralateral approach has a, uh, in our series, less risk of post-op dysesthesia, but there's a steep learning curve in the contralateral approach. And uh, extraforminal disc only, I think uh, transforminal approach has an easy assess. And uh, care if, as long as we take care and handling of uh, exiting the fruit, I felt that uh, we should uh, give uh, sufficient uh, sensory nerve root block, even in the uh, GA cases, in this uh, patients who, who need to manipulate the root ganglion. Upward migrating this, I feel that the interlaminal approach is good, the central this as well. Uh, I find that uh, there's limitation in uh, transforminal approach, or uh, there's excessive ventral vasectomy is needed uh, to get through the central region of the disc. So I do interlaminal approach or bipotal approach for this group. And if there's a concurrent stenosis, interlaminal approach is preferred or bipotal approach can be done. Uh, I feel that they are efficient in removing the ligamentum flavum as compared to transforminal approach. Of course, uh, transforminal approach for patients who uh, cannot tolerate GA is also an option for FA uh, for unilateral stenosis with uh, prolapses. In patients who uh, have high iliac crest, high BMI, uh, transforminal approach can be challenging. Uh, I do not say uh, I do not feel that it's contraindicated, but it can be challenging. So, you, based on your experience, you assess whether you should be doing them transforminally. For narrow foramen and uh, far out syndrome, such as uh, TTA stenosis, Pelotoli syndrome, I find that uh, transforminal approach or uh, will be uh, most more uh, proficient than uh, contralateral approach. Uh, that's my own, own opinion. You can do that using the UDE uh, or uh, microscopic as well. But uh, I personally like the use for a spinal stenosis scope and a transformative approach. Essentially, uh, these are the few readings that you can read uh, regarding my uh, talk. Uh, it's, it's published online and it's open access. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity.